Okay, we are not going to punish anybody that's on time today. And first of all, I want to say thank you to all you nice folks that are here tonight to do our late spring surf fishing seminar. Uh, I always ask how many people have been to any of my seminars previous? Okay, great, that's wonderful. To you folks that have not been here, I will go over. I, there's a format that I use for almost all my seminars. But first and foremost, I want to thank the, uh, the Snook Nook. Of course, Freddie and Alec uh, have been running these seminars since January with great success. And if, uh, if you're new to the area or you've been here forever, everybody knows the Snook Nook. And I always say the same thing about the Snook Nook. Uh, if you go into the Snook Nook to get something and they don't have it, you probably don't need it. Because if there's any fishing thing, whether you're going to go deep dropping offshore or trolling for sailfish or fishing the beach, it's going to be in this store. And uh, the staff here is second to none. I am like to say I'm proud that I'm part of that staff every Thursday morning from 6 to 12. So if you have any questions about anything, about surf fishing or anything, and you're in the area on Thursdays, I am here every Thursday morning. To the folks that haven't been to one of my seminars, obviously I am Paul Spurko, and if you're here for my seminar, you're in the right spot. If you're not, I'm not quite sure why you are here. But that's okay. But, but here we go, and, and basically most of my seminars, and I do seminars all over Florida, I do them with Bass Pro Shops, I do some with George Poveromo on the Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series. Uh, we, we do them all over, and my normal seminar, if anybody's been to one of mine at a Bass Pro, it's about two hours, minimum. So you, this is the capsulized version, and what we're going to do, I'm going to hit some bullet points that I think are the are the high points on a lot of different pages now to everybody that's on facebook thank you for tuning in and if you do want one of the handouts you will be able to get one through alec by contacting the snook nook and giving them your email address and alec will email you a uh, a handout um i follow i put a lot of effort into this and and every if you've been to previous seminars it looks like it's the same, but every one that I do has new information. I add, delete, I always change things, but there's a lot to cover in here, and since I have about an hour and 10 minutes, I'm not gonna be able to cover everything that's in here. So, for the folks that are here, if you have a question afterwards, whether it's something that I say, because we're gonna hold the questions till the end so we can get through here, um, I will stay as long as I have to to answer all your questions. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, the handout obviously is yours to keep. You can make notes on it. You can use it for wallpaper. You can, uh, you can do anything you like. Um, but obviously this one is on late spring surf fishing. And of course, the late spring surf fishing is a transitional time. And I, obviously, the Pompano, I'm going to dedicate about half the time to Pompano because Pompano mania is still with us, and there's still plenty of fish here. So most folks want to know about Pompano fishing. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to, because what I talked about in January here about catching Pompano, where, baits, tactics, what to do, a lot of that's changed because as this water warms, the water today, by the way, out front at the Jensen buoy and the Fort Pierce buoy was 79 degrees. Well, it's getting warm. Now, with the transitional time, everything changes. Your tactics, your tackle, uh, the bite patterns of the fish. Pompano that I'm going to get into in a couple minutes. You know, during the winter, and I say the winter, November, December, January, February, usually early morning, is the time to fish for them. Well, you fast forward to about daylight saving time when the days get a little longer, there's more sunlight out, and it didn't happen this year, and I'll talk about the condition of the Pompano fishery along here um, right now. That all switches, and that's the way it is now. A couple weeks ago, we started to see a real nice uptick in catching fish, and of course, uh, there has been one thing that has kind of kept us from 
boating more, or boating, landing more Pompano. And it's been that way all winter and all spring, and it's almost gotten worse. It's the guy in the gray suit, the one with the fin on his head. The shark population out here right now is ridiculous. Um, the other day I fished on Monday, and a lot of the folks that I fished with, a couple of the commercial fellows, always say, ah, they won't eat bonefish. And I'm going to talk about bonefish briefly. Well, I will tell you that every year there's more and more bonefish. Monday it got to the point where I, I had some double headers of bonefish. But they seem to be everywhere, and I have a picture on my phone that I brought back to show one of my real good friends who was steadfast about they won't eat bonefish. And I did get, I got one to the beach who was, the head was just about off and the tail was completely off that he grabbed on the way in. But if there's one thing right now, and of course right now, the weeds are a situation. It's been that way this week. But we have been battling these sharks for weeks and weeks and weeks. Now, the key, I will tell you on these pompano, if you can find, we have plenty of clean water. You know, during the, during the winter, with all that wind, we had some issues with water. Water's not an issue. It's the sharks. But if you can find a beach that has clean water, your chances of putting some pompano on the beach or in your cooler are, uh, are, are really, really, really good. Um, what's happening up and down here with pompano? Anybody that tells you and I'm, obviously I'm going to concentrate on Pompano first. Anybody that tells you that they had a great Pompano winter, probably one of the best years they've ever had, plenty of fish, recreational limits caught them all the time, you, you, you got to put a call out on that one because that didn't happen. I mean, I, I look at my tickets from because I do it commercially also. And by the way, the conditions and the fishing have been so inconsistent that I have not done, I did not do a Pompano charter all winter. I take that back, I did one. I did one and we caught a few fish. But uh, my position is if I don't can't go to the beach with a reasonable chance of putting six fish in your cooler, I'm probably not gonna take it because it just, I, I won't do it, I won't do it. But anyway, to make a long story short, in the, we were hoping in January it was gonna turn and it was gonna start picking up and things were gonna get better, but that really never happened. Now. Did we catch some fish? Yeah, you catch some fish. But for a lot of us, you know, you go out and get three or four fish, guess what? That was a pretty good day. So the Pompano situation, whether it's the warm water, we did not have a cold winter. And if you, and the folks from Fish Bites that are in St. Augustine and Jacksonville, I mean, they're still catching fish up there in January and February. Uh, that just shouldn't be. I mean, it just shouldn't be. A lot of those fish either didn't move, or if they did, they went east. Now, fast forward to today. They're still catching fish down below Juneau. Why? It's 79 degrees. The consensus is hopefully this is going to be a late season. We have fish that will move into the area. And for two, two weeks ago, I mean, you could reasonably go to the beach and expect to catch some because there were some fish around. We were, it was crazy in the beginning here in the, in the spring because we were getting big fish. I mean, two pounds, two and a half pounds, three pounds. You usually get them in the fall and early winter. And then the spring fish, that's when you catch the numbers on the pompano because those are the smaller fish. They're 12 inches, 13. You'll get some 14 inches of pound fish, pound and a quarter, pound and a half. But instead of, if, you know, under normal years, when I did it recreationally during this time of year, late spring, there were a lot of days you didn't fish 45 minutes. You might get three double headers in here, you know, in a half an hour, you're on the way home because you're not going to play catch and release. That is the norm for spring fishing. But baits, tactics, where you fish, all that changes now. How far off the beach? So, if you, if you, the folks, for the folks right here, and not the uh, Facebook way, like I say, you can get it. If you go to the intro page, the nice thing about this time of year, you get a pretty nice catch list as this water warms because as the bait moves in 
And you can see the catch lists are croaker, whiting, bonefish, bluefish, blue runners, ladyfish, tarpon and permit that I'm going to talk about also. <clears throat> permit are somewhat like the bonefish, the way the bonefish have increased in numbers. We had a great, I had a great October with permit. I had a stretch where I had five straight trips with permit anywhere from 15 to 20 pounds. So there are permit around, there are permits showing now. May and June are two months, warmer water, they're migrating down, uh, you got an opportunity to catch one. So, but the catch list here coming in is, is pretty darn good as we enter late spring. So, but let's, I'm going to concentrate on the Pompano for a few minutes because 90% of, of everybody sitting here and everybody that, that's watching wants to catch Pompano. One thing about Pompano, if you're looking at the handout here, if you go to that page three and as we go down, I'll let, I ran into somebody the other day. I want to clarify something here. I had a guy fishing next to me at, uh, at uh, Coconut one day who was a recreational fella and he caught a couple and put them in the cooler and as he was leaving he caught two or three fish he said and one of them to me looked a little shaky a lot of times you can kind of take a look if you catch enough of them you say boy i'm not sure that's a keeper but anyway and you know ignorance the fwc doesn't want to know about it but here's the situation he says yeah i got i got two i got two here to take home i said great let me see them so i looked in the cooler i said did you measure them he goes yeah 11 inches okay 11 inches. I didn't want to ask what kind of ruler it was, but he thought it was 11 inches overall length to the tip of the tail. I said, my recommendation to you is they're dead now. So, but if FWC stops you, you're, you're not going to want, you're not going to like the result. Let's put it that way. But it's 11 inches to the fork. And I'm sure as I look around here, everybody that, that's here knows that. But uh, what happens to these fish in the late spring you know i say where 70 to 100 yards is the average and that's where we fish from you know i fish from port st lucie up to fort pierce primarily uh usually hope sound in the spring is the go-to spot this year it's the spot to stay away from because they're doing more beach replenishment and the water's been dirty dirty on and off so there a lot of the folks that i know that fish that are living hope sound are all up here and that's all you have to need to know so that's the go-to spot that's because they have a reef but what we have out here we have sandbar the second trough from fort or from uh, st lucie inlet all the way up to fort pierce when you get up near fort pierce when you get north of the power plant the beaches get deeper you start to see some worm rock you start to see some reef um the uh, a couple like coconut Surfside corpus as you get up that way you can't reach it's it's quite a cast to reach it but that reef keeps them in that trough out here at sandbars and i will tell you and i think i probably said it in january these fish need some water but this time of year they have a tendency to come in closer than they do during the winter and i mean a lot closer I had 13 or 14 fish up a coconut a couple weeks ago, and I caught seven of them about 50 yards off the beach. I fish one rod in close, especially if there's a high tide. If you got plenty of water, because that's, remember, the second bar, you know, you look at that, fir that first edge of the sand, and you'll see the sand fleas, and there have been some sand fleas around. You'll see some sand fleas, the small crabs, you know, that the whiting and croaker are eating. Well, you got the same thing on the second bar, and that's that's another reason why you're fishing there, but you're also fishing the downside of that. I like to fish the downside, inside edge of that second bar, but there, it's a food supply. You got to remember, these are in someone in the jack family. They eat and they swim. That's what they do. And I always like to say during every Pompano seminar, the most consistent part of Pompano fishing off the beach is the inconsistency from day to day. Just because you think you got it figured out one day at Coconut, do not think for one minute if you show up there the next morning, your rod's gonna bend like it did the day before because on a tie change, it'll move. But there's reasons they do that. Okay, so let me get back to the beaches as we go up. They will be in closer. I will fish, I fish four rods, four 13 footers, probably 
90 to 100, 90 to 180, and this time of year, my fourth rod, if you look at it, it's about 50 yards off the beach because they will actually come in there. I had a buddy of mine, a blue heron, this week, conventional, cast it, had a tangle about 20 yards off the beach. He's fixing the tangle. Do I have to tell you? He takes this, he finally gets it all undone. He picks it up, and all of a sudden I see I see him with the rod is going like this, and about a two and a half pound pop. I wasn't 20 yards off. So the point is they would they will come in closer. You usually don't get those in close fish during the winter. This time of year you will do. You'll see some of the folks that are starting to fish for the whiting and croaker with the short pitch rods. You know, these seven footers, because the whiting and croaker is showing up, you'll see them start to catch popping up. Time-wise, this is here's here's the biggest change, and I mentioned it before. High tide in the afternoon, three o'clock to five o'clock. If you've got a high tide at three thirty or four o'clock, run to the beach because the stars are aligning. That's what you want. They like high water. They like a lot of water. Now, the only problem is you get past five o'clock, five thirty, six o'clock. I will tell you this: the lower the light comes down. The guys in the gray suit show up. It seems as if you start to lose daylight, the sharks seem to show. Not that they need to show up any more than they're doing during the middle of the day, but if it, if it uh, aggravates the matter with them showing up because it's getting darker. But again, a couple things to do with this pompano with the sharks. If I start getting sharked off one after another, a lot of times I go from four rods to three rods to two rods to one rod and then I'll stop fishing. You gotta understand what's going on here. If there's one thing good about sharks, if they're around, there's probably something for them to eat. You're hoping it's pompano and not bonefish, like unless you wanna catch bonefish, like the other day. So, because there's a food supply for them, but if you stop, you're throwing sinkers out into the sand. That's why, if you have somebody fishing, been fishing all day, hasn't caught anything, I would like to fish where he is. Sinkers go into the sand, creates a puff of sand, stirs the bottom. Well, if you've got four of those going out, there's activity. Constant activity if you're fishing all day. Now, if you're checking your bait like you should, you're doing that every five or ten minutes. You're casting and reeling, casting and reeling. Activity will breed fish biting, looking to see him what's going on. Now, unfortunately for this year, the sharks are on onto us. So I will go as long as 30 or 45 minutes. One day at uh, a Porpoise, not too long ago, I went a whole hour. One hour, I did not put a line in the water. Now, after I did not fish for an hour, I ended up catching a few pompano. I did not get sharked off. So constant activity, constant fish moving through the water will continue to attract the sharks it's just the nature of the beast I mean it's uh, you talk to 15 guys and they'll say oh there's no commercial shark fishing anymore there's no this there's no that the dive boats attract them but uh, again they're here but you can find beaches because I had a few afternoons up north where I did not get sharked off so if you get lucky enough and you find one where you're not getting sharked off fish that beach because I say the water's been clean this time of year now you wouldn't know it today and the only reason this winds blowing today because I'm doing a seminar it seems every time I do a seminar it either rains or blows you know 50 out of the southeast but the, uh, the situation with the uh, with the water it tends to calm we get less wave action and the water cleans up big time water that is very very clean great for permit especially if you're getting that blue tint. I'll talk about that with the permit. It gets real clean, and when it gets calm, you would like to see a little bit of that milkiness or a little bit of murky water because that Pompano have big eyes. they got great eyes. From a bait standpoint, this time of year, and a rig standpoint, even my rigs that I make and they have inside, the last comment that I have in the, in the handout is no bling in the spring. 
if it's real calm and real clean, I will take the floats off. Less jewelry equals more bites because they have great eyes. I use a small hook, I use a number one circle hook, that helps. There are days when it's so calm and clean, I like leaving the red bead, but there are days I will take that off. Now, if you, depending on what kind you make or the kind that you, you know, the kind that you uh, uh, buy, like mine, you can actually take, that's just on there with the loop. I have a double, two dropper loops, and I can actually take this, I take my hook off, and then I'll take the bead off and or the float. Again, it's in your hand down, no bling in the spring. And that's exactly what that means. Some days, the less you have in the water other than the bait, the better your chances of getting a bite. They have great, great eyesight. Tide changes. Here's another situation with Pompano. If I'm on the beach, whether it's dead low or dead high, and I'm a half an hour from a tide change, you can bet your life I'm waiting for the tide change for a couple different reasons. Uh, and I'm gonna give, uh, here, I'll give you another great example. I fished with a fella uh, for years for striped bass. We used to clam for him on an area called the Pipe off Manaloki, New Jersey. That 45 minutes around the tide change, he would come out of the wheelhouse, he'd come down in, into, the, uh, into the salon area and he'd sit down and otherwise he was constantly watching the machine starts reading the paper, he goes, you guys can fish the next 45 minutes, he says, you're wasting your time. You're not going to get any bites. And when it got to be about 45 or 50 minutes after that, up he went, and guess what? Here we go again. They like water movement, they like tide movement. West wind, and we had a lot of west wind the last couple weeks there, we had a stretch of four or beautiful for going offshore, gorgeous. It'll put a damper on this, on these pompano. And here's why, too calm. That 10 to 12, and like I said before, I don't know if I said it to Artie, I don't know who I said it to, but, or Arnie, but uh, here's the situation. 10 to 15, today I think it was 10 plus 15. But a little bit of stirred up water, 10 to 12, a two to three foot chop, perfect. First day of the west, they say, is the best here for the Pompano. When the, tomorrow it's supposed to go northwest. If it blows the weeds off after having all this southeast wind, I will guarantee you, with the color of this water, if you pick the right beach, you're going to catch some fish. Because once this gets knocked down and it becomes more fishable, they will bite. I mean, they don't like it 20, 25 knots either. They have a tendency to go to deeper water. Well, they're actually hooked. they're still catching some off the bridge occasionally. They'll actually come in the inlet, these pop it on, and in they come. But that first day, when it does calm down, find the right beach and you'll probably get some bites. So far this year, this late spring as we're, as we're calling this, I will tell you that the Pompano bite from the power plant north, and there's probably some guys I know that if they are watching that I fish with are about to put an X through my face somewhere. Everything is north. Some, you know, we didn't catch fish at Middle Cove for a year or so, they got too sharky. There were some fish caught there just before this weather change. So you get north, Blue Heron is another one, has been real, real, real good. For some reason, those fish are staying up by Fort Pierce Inlet. And the, down here, and I will say another thing about down here, and I probably said it in January, because that's when it kind of started. The wind shifts, the big winds that we had during the winter, unless you're fishing high tide down here, you better know where the cuts and the runouts are because once that tide gets about an hour or two after high on the outgoing, you're not going to have enough water to catch any fish. A lot of, a lot of these beaches down this way have kind of filled in. Um, but you need water. They need water. They need a way to get in and they need a way to get out. Normally this time of year, bathtub beach, believe it or not. Boy, you can just pound some pompano there. Now, if anybody saw Ed Killer's picture the other day, he has renamed bathtub beach. It is called Sandbox Beach. That's what he's calling it. If you saw what they did to Bathtub Beach here in this last week, it will tear your heart out. You can, on the north end, they have trucked in so much sand, you can almost walk out to the reef. It's, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they ruined it. Now, but everybody knows what's going to happen down there. That's a great spot in the late spring. 
what's going to happen six months from now? All the sand's going to be gone again. And they've spent all those millions of dollars. But if that, in fact, if there's a way for those Pompano to get into Bathtub Beach, whether on the end, by the inlet, through the rocks, when they come in, give that a shot. I, I have not looked at it. Obviously, it's closed. You can't get there anyway. I have a buddy who lives at Sailfish Point who has been catching fish there. But that was before all the sand just got trucked in. But that's that's a good area. Around high tide, I'll tell you, uh, Beach Walk, uh, Bob Graham, Normandy, they have all held some fish this spring, but you gotta time yourself. You gotta be there when there's enough water. Otherwise, uh, uh, you know, to say, and of course, I never say you'll never catch anything because as soon as I do that, you'll go there dead low and get a limit. But Percentage-wise, if that's where you like to fish, just time your trips around uh, around high tide. The water color, like I said, if it looks good for swim fins and uh, snorkels, it's good for permit and bonefish. It might be a little bit tough for the pompano. So if you can find something with just a little murkiness, you know that nice light, that light green with a little bit of milky murkiness in it, boy, that's. Uh, Run and get your rods because you're probably going to find some fish and get some bites. I always like to go over this a little bit, and if and if uh, I take a lot of people on the beach, not so much this year. And the biggest reason, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this for a minute, and then probably move on here because we haven't got all kinds of time. There's a couple different things that you do. I have a page in the in the handout, and I, I think it is it's what to do if you're not getting bites. I think it's page 18. The 18. Yeah, page 18. I keep my rods when I cast my sinkers out, and I set up my rods. There is no slack going from that tip to the sinker. My rods are actually bent. Now, this time of year, you shouldn't have too much of a use for these Sputnik sinkers, but if you need to, Pompano don't like a moving bait. You can jig them on the beach, or jig them on the, in a river, but you get on the beach, they want that bait stationary. So you need a stationary. If I come back, because I'm fishing four rods, if I look down at one of my rods, and it's straight up and down, two things happened, could have happened. I missed one. Right now you would say maybe you got sharked off or you have one on. Another situation, a coconut. And this fellow fishes all the time. I give him more credit and I could not believe it. I was fishing with my son Randy about a week and a half ago and he had three rods out and he, his were somewhat, had tension on them. We watched the first rod, it went straight up and down, and you can see the tip like this. Now the fellow sitting in his chair, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, I swear on my kids. And I said, Randy, he's got a fish. And he said, and it's been on for 10 minutes. Now the good news was, obviously there's no shark, so the shark would have had that 10 minutes before. When he went to check his bait, the rod doubled over. So you know, I know that when that rod has tension on it, my bait is set, but once it gets released, once I, that tip is straight up and down, and I kind of angle my rods just a little bit so I get a little better vision as I look up and down the beach, but once that rod gets straight, you need to get to the rod because that will tell you that in fact you have one. And with all these sharks around, I will I will tell you, and it's the same thing with permit, if you're gonna target the permit, do not Keep a tight drag. The snook nook will love you for it because the first 150 pound black tip or bull shark that grabs it with a tight drag, especially if you got a little bit of an angle, uh, SpaceX will have nothing on you because that rod and rod reel will be in the Bahamas. There's plenty of sharks, and I'll tell you what, that first hit on a permit, you're going to know it's a permit. When you a lot of times with a permit bite, and I'll talk about it in a few minutes, with a permit bite, you think you might have a shark, but when you don't get bit off, take your time. But I'll, I'll talk about that. So that's it with the pompadour. The other thing this time of year, water temperature is warm. It's, 
getting warmer, and I still see a lot of folks, what they do, and there's a couple commercial guys that got called out on it. They got thrown out of where we were selling our fish. You go and you get a bucket of water this time of year. If you're recreational, you're probably catching them to eat. And I'm sure the price is still in the high 20s for retail, so they're, they're a beautiful eating fish. But they put them in a bucket of seawater, and you see the tail sticking out of the five gallon. Well, the guy's there two or three hours. Well, it was 79 when you took it out of the ocean before the sun started cooking it. I can't imagine what those fish are like when they get them home. The key is here, make sure you bring a cooler. And what I, I know, I bring a lot of ice. I bring a, a big block and I bring cubes. And once I catch two or three pompano, I then get some water, because it's gonna melt the ice somewhat, you know, and you, and you make that slush in the bottom. Keep them in there because when you get them home, they are perfect. But this time of year, I mean, you can you can take them home and you go to cook them, they're gonna be like mashed potatoes because this water's getting warm. So, uh, that's that's what I have to say about the pompano. And like I said, I I could go on here. Believe me, anybody's been to my pompano seminar, I could go here till about ten o'clock. But obviously, I can't. Um, time wise for pompano, everybody thinks it's a late season. I usually start fishing for them before everybody else. I usually catch some fish around Labor Day. A lot of them are resident fish, and a lot of them are small. You'll catch twenty and keep one. But there are some fish around. Last year, I still caught some right near Memorial Day. So, you have time. There's fish south. Don't give up on them yet. You might get to the point, I might get to the point where if it starts to slow down, I'll only fish maybe two rods and, and play with the whiting and croaker, or put an extra rod out for a permit, because May and June are great months for permit. But, there's I, everybody believes, and there's a lot of folks doing it a lot longer than I am, that this is going to be a long season in that when they finally stop coming, you know, people, as a rule, you know, some of the folks now are going back north, but if you're local and you're a resident, don't, do not stop yet, because there should be plenty of opportunities, and if recreational-wise, if we get the shot of fish that we should get, and some of these sharks start moving off, they say uh, some of these black tips will start moving shortly, which I hope they do, uh, the chances of putting a recreational limit together are, are pretty pretty darn good. Um, so that's that's it with the Pompano. Anybody has any questions about anything I just said, and I'm sure there will be, I'm happy to stay afterwards and I'll answer anything that you want to know. Tackle-wise, like I said, I, I said before, I like the small hook. And I fish I fish four rods just so you know what, the, what my setup is, and you folks can do anything you want to do, but I fish two rods with nothing but plain fish bites on them. And there's a picture in there of how I put them on the hook. And the key is, I cut a tail in the bottom of them, just like that, on the longer longer piece. Now these are the pre-cut strips. If you're getting the, if you buy the regular bait strip, the first one obviously has a flat top. I cut it on an angle all the way down, and anywhere from an inch and a half to an inch and three quarters is the length. I put the hook through the top of the diamond. On the bottom, I'm cutting a slit that goes up because it will actually give it motion. It'll give it some movement. The nice thing about the smaller hook is, you know, if we use the old kale hooks that folks use for years and years and years, 2030 kale hook, you could cut that fish bite past that hook and all you're gonna get is that hook laying down like this. It's, it's so big and heavy. So the smaller hook permits the fish bite to have a much better action when it's in the water. If you don't believe me, try something when you get one of those troughs running up and down, cut the tail on one and take a look and see what it looks like. It, it really, really looks good. But that's that's what I fish just like that. Two of these, then I'll fish this time of year. Once the bluefish leave, I'll put a clam strip on that I've, you know, I, I put it in the, uh, in the kosher salt overnight, the little pieces, and I'll put a clam strip on. I match the bait, natural bait with the scent of the fish bite. Clam scent, clam bait. The other rod will get a sand flea. Sand flea scent, where you can actually use uh, a crab scent. I've had some luck. I've had some luck this year with a, a new uh, a new one that they're making now. It's called Electric Chicken. It's got a couple different colors on it. 
Uh, so that's a pretty good one. But if it's a crab, match it with a crab. The other, the other bait are crab knuckles, and I'm going to talk about them in just a second with the permit because it's a great permit bait also. So match the scent to the natural bait you're using. These baits have different scents. Verified. When Freddie and I did the uh, radio show with Dano, who used to be the producer, I think him and Drabo had bet uh, uh, Dano $100. He wouldn't put three different pieces of fish bite in his mouth to see if they actually had a difference. He ended up puking in the garbage can. But but the bottom line is they do have different scent. If you talk to the Carr family who did this, what they did, and Dr. Carr, who just passed away, he was the marine biologist who made this bait, took the DNA from a lot of, well, not a lot of them, all of them, and actually broke it down to a scent. Just the scent jars that they have, I was up at the plant, they have a little jar like that. It, it's powdery, it's very, very concentrated. If you had to produce that, it's about 5,000 a jar. That's, that's how intense that scent is. They're making some now with a new double scent. So they have some new baits coming out, but match the bait to what you're using. So, and there are days when the sand flea will start catching them and I'll put a sand flea on two or three rods and here we go. So what's ever working, color-wise, bait-wise, switch over. Because you gotta remember, pompano don't bite all day long. This is not like Chum and Bluefish in New Jersey where you can go out for three hours and catch as many as you want. When they bite, take advantage of it. But match the bait or use the bait that's producing for you that day. Okay, let's talk about the bonefish. I do not have a page on the bonefish, so the, the people on uh, Facebook will, will be able to be equal with you here because they don't have anything to look at. But the bonefish, more and more every year. I just said just the other day, how about double headers on bonefish? And what was happening the other day, up in, I don't care who I talked to, I was fishing at uh, Blue Heron. There was a buddy of mine fishing at John Brooks. There was another one fishing at Surfside up to the north. We were all catching them, bonefish now. And it's, here's a perfect example too of something. The water on top wasn't super clean or clear, but I will tell you that the water on the bottom had to be perfect, gin clear. All the bonefish, where do they catch them? They catch them on flats. You know, and, and uh, I had a, a buddy that was a big fly fisherman, and he, he goes, oh, you're talking down about bonefish. I said, no, but they're, they're so fast, they get to the bait before the pompano. He goes, there's people paying $1,000, $1,500 a day over in the Bahamas trying to catch one, and you're trying to shake them off your hooks. Well, we have a bonefish population that has gotten bigger every year. They love easy flea. Hands down, nothing to talk about. You want to target some bonefish, or the white crab is the other bait, and that's what the permit does also. But there are a lot of bonefish. Some of them are small, some of them are big. Now, you're going to know it's a bonefish because you got to understand you're using a 12 or 13 foot rod or even an 11 foot rod. That rod goes down, well, you think I got a real one. This is a nice pompano I got on here. That first run, if any, I've never caught one on a regular rod. I've only caught them on this. Goes, 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 and all of a sudden, kind of stops. That's a bonefish. Now, here's another thing about a bonefish because they fight so hard and they're pulling on a 12 foot rod that could be 100 yards off the beach and they've just taken 50 or 60 yards and they run down the beach. When you do get them in, as quick, if you want to take a picture to have your phone ready or have somebody with a phone ready, get them back in the water. They will fight to the death. They are very, they are not hardy. So. I remember the first couple I caught, I just pitched them in and all of a sudden they washed back up. I actually had to pick it up and revive it. So as quick as I can get it off, I'll keep a pair of pliers, I won't even touch it. I'll walk the rod down and I'll, I'll shake them off. But get them back in because there is no need to kill one of those fish because you're not gonna keep it anyway. But lots of bonefish around. They like sand fleas, they like crabs. Let's talk about permit. That's, uh, I think that's page 11 in here in your handout, and we'll, we'll talk about them for a minute. Our permit population continues to grow. It used to be people in boats would tell you during the spring, 
you're, they were going to get bait or fish around the boils by the power plant. Middle Cove used to be the beach. You could see schools of them coming down a beach on a calm day. First of all, they look like manhole covers, but they're silver. The sun will reflect off them. A lot of times you'll see them right on top of the water. But there's big schools, they say, at the boils. Now it doesn't make any difference. They seem to be up and down. I know some folks that caught them the other day. But these, some of the guys call them calico, some of them call them white spotted crabs. I will tell you about that bait. That's a great bait. I bring a pair of, pair of shears, and you don't get real big ones. And if you wanted to catch some of those calicos or white, white spotted crabs, get a ball of monofilm, unused, 30, 40 pounds. Or, or used rather, that you're getting ready to throw away or send back to Berkeley. Get about a one ounce trolling weight that you would use to pull a lure offshore. Put about a 6-0 hook onto the end of the trolling weight. Put the trolling weight in the center of your ball of monofilm and get a mullet, get a jack fillet, anything that's got some scent, put that on the hook. Have an extra rod, and this time of year, pitch it out about 10 or 15 yards into the surf, put it in the sand spike, and wait about 10 or 15 minutes. Big time works down in Cope Sound, but I'm, I'm getting some crabs up here now. This is the time of year you get them. Now what happens, the crabs will see or smell that scent. They come up, and now they're starting to chomp on the piece of uh, mullet or whatever you got on that, on that hook. But guess what? The claws get caught in the monofilm. You bring it in, I mean, I've, I've had days where you bring five, six at a time. I mean, you've got enough bait for the whole day. But if you leave it out there, you're gonna get some. And once you get the crab in, the knuckles, obviously the claws, no. And there's no, on these things, there's no size limits, FWC, and you can come down and measure it uh, for me or say, oh, you're against the law. But the knuckles, the actual knuckles that come out, cut them into pieces, put them on a hook and throw them right back out. I like the knuckles first, and then I will, especially if they're smaller ones, I will take a pair of shears that I have that I bring with me, and with the shell on, cut them into four pieces. And then you've got the tubes that come out where the legs come out, put your hook right through that tube. Permit candy, they love it. Absolutely love those white crabs. Now, there's, there's some guys that I know that actually go and get blue claws, and obviously blue claws are gonna work also too. But these are readily available, and if you get a, a crab catcher, it won't take you very long to get them. Now, I will tell you this, the big ones, those big white spotted crabs, blue claw got nothing on them. So make sure you got gloves or a rag, otherwise you're gonna be like a little kid who, with the cartoon that grabs his toe, man, they hurt. But there are plenty of them around. It's a great bait for permit. One ounce. One ounce. Yep. Just so it stays on the bottom. You don't want to cast it very far. You want to keep it nice and close. That's, yep. You'll, you'll see them running along the edge of the surf. Fish bites, white crab, and obviously uh, Alex got a nice supply in there. That, that bait, I've caught more permit on that white crab. Yellow crab's good too, and those easy fleet, but not like white crab. Uh, it's just whatever, whether it's the scent, whether it's the color, permit, love it. Again, if you're using the shell from a white spotted crab or a calico, it's got that white sheen to it. I personally think it's color and it's got a crab scent. But boy, I'll tell you what, you want to hook a permit. Now remember, you're not in prime time yet. May and June are the two months for that. What, what a great fight. And as I mentioned before, when the rod goes down, and it takes off. They will, they, a big jack will normally go due east. A big permit will normally go north and south. So what I, when I'm fishing for them, if there's nobody around me, if I'm fishing four rods, I fan my baits out. I'll cast one on an angle here, I'll cast one on an angle here, and I'll fish two straight out. Because that first run, you're gonna think you got a shark. Especially if you're getting a 20, 25 pound permit. That's a lot of fish. And once they take off, what you're probably, you don't want them tangling your other lines. You get in there, of course, then you got an automatic hook remover. But that's what happens, and it's happened with my first couple. I thought they were sharks years ago. I thought they were sharks, and they were not. They were permit. 
they will run north and south. You can normally get some line on them, but as they go north and south, follow the fish down the beach. Do not leave line. You don't want an extra 80 yards of line in the water. Cut that angle down. You want to be east and west with a permit because too much north, too much south, you got all that line in the water. And the other thing is I use 15 pound monocles. I'm fishing them on popping around. I'm fishing 15 pound monofilm. So a 25 pound permit on 15 pound mono, there's not a lot of room for air. Back to drag off. When you don't lose that fish, it's either a big jack, but that's usually one that's gonna go east. But if you go, you've got a fish going north and south, and a lot of times they'll come up on top of the surface. And when they turn, once you see silver, you know what it is, or those black tip fins, you know what it is. Cut the angle down, but with 15 pound, you can't horse it. You're not gonna horse that fish. You gotta take your time. Cut the angle down, and just like with the pompano, I do not, pompano fishing's the same. I got the long rods. When I hook a fish and everybody I take and guide on the beach, my first thing I tell everybody, point the rod at the fish. You got a 13 foot rod with all that line, with all that pressure, with a smaller hook. I always say the same thing to folks when they get a big pompano or a permit. Slow and steady wins the race. He's not gonna bite it off. They haven't got big teeth that are gonna bite it off. Take your time. When you cut the angle down, and make sure the drag is not too tight, because here's what's gonna happen. The biggest one I caught last year took me almost 35 minutes to get him to the beach. Now, once you get him in, the first time that permit feels the sand by that first trough, not gonna like it. He's going again. But he'll normally go a little bit east than north or south. They constantly swim north and south when they're hooked. That's when you're gonna know you got a permit. Let them go on that first one, and when you get in, it's almost a two-man operation. If you're doing it by yourself, you better be pretty good because what you need to do is when you see them come in, I let the wave, like the pop, I let the wave help me, bring it in, and when he gets close enough, grab his tail. We grab his tail and yank him out of the water or actually drag him on the sand a little bit. Now, I will tell you this. In the beginning, I thought this was just great. Boy, I got a nice 25-pound permit. Took it home. I don't keep the big ones anymore. And the, the little ones, I will. I had. I kept a, a the five or six pounder, by the way, like most fish. Tastes a lot better than a 25 pounder. 25 pounder of breeders. I mean, they're. And, and again, they have such a big rib cage. You're not going to. It's not like a pompano where you cut that little bit of a rib cage out. I personally think the fish is too good of a game fish, too nice of a game fish to keep. Get a picture, get them back, let them go. But you will, I tell you what, you'll feel pretty good when you got that picture and you're holding that fish like this and it's 20 or 25 pounds. It looks like a manhole cover. But boy, it is fun, especially on lighter line. You need to take your time. Clear water, clean, clear blue water. When we see that now, when I go up onto the beach and you see that blue and it's clear, the first thing is permit water. We're going to start seeing more and more of that as we get into the later spring and early summer because they just, they like clean water. They're, they're no different than bonefish. I mean, there are days a year ago in May, I caught permit, bonefish, and pompano. You can catch all of them during May. You can catch, actually, you can catch them right now. I, I know they're catching a few down below us here in West Palm and, and Juneau. But when the water gets real clean, that's the time for the permit. And don't think because you're using a 1-0 or a number one circle hook, that won't, they're gonna, they, their mouths are kind of rubbery like, uh, like the pompano. That hook will stay right in there. Now you can remember, I got a 30, you know, I'm using a 25 or 30 pound fluorocarbon leader too. So your main lines, I'm using 15, but you use whatever you choose. And the reason, the other reason for the, the light line, and I, I didn't cover it because I haven't got a lot of time to do it, on these long cast spinning reels, because that's what I'm using now. If you use a conventional, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody used them for years, these new 
Penn makes it, Akuma makes it, Shimano makes it. I personally, for obvious reasons, like Penn. But that long cast reel, the spool is taller and wider. Less friction when you cast, almost 50% less friction than a standard spool on a spinning reel. I use four ounce pyramids. I, I will switch to three here in May if we don't have a lot of wind, but a four ounce pyramid, 15 pound test, small diameter line. And if you're going to splice, I splice my leader onto the 15 pound test. I use 30 pound P-line fluorocarbon, about an eight foot piece. I do it with a blood knot. Some folks like to use a double uni. You know, there, there's, a, there's an offshore knot, there's some other knots you can use. The reason I like my blood knot, the profile on the knot is very small. I'm using guides that are pretty, pretty small. They will not hit those guides when you go to cast them. You're gonna get it right out and off you go. But that's, that, that knot, that, uh, that blood knot has a, and the P-line, the reason I use that, it's a very soft fluorocarbon. Some fluorocarbon is very stiff. The soft fluorocarbon allows that knot to make, you can make it even smaller. I don't like them for rigs because I like that double dropper loop to stand out from the main line a little bit. But the P-line, because it's a soft fluorocarbon, you can pull that super tight and cut the tag ends when you do splice them with a blood knot, cut it as close as you can. It might take a little getting used to. My son, when he first started doing it, thought he was making them right. And when you go to cast and you know the, the sinker ends up in the Bahamas, but there's nothing hooked to your line anymore. Make, just make sure it's snug. You can moisten it a little bit in your mouth. It will tighten it down. But the 15 pound with a blood knot, with a 30 pound leader, you're good to go for Pompano, Permit, or Bonefish. It's, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just that easy. So that's, that's the Permit. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be some questions about that later. I also put a page in here about tarpon. Now, the reason I put a page in here about tarpon, they are showing. We saw some tarpon on the beach a week ago, two weeks ago. We're starting to see some of these baits move down the beach. We're seeing some dolphin, we're, you know, flipper dolphin come up and down. But the tarpon are starting to show. When the tarpon get here, if you've never hooked a tarpon off the beach, it's the thrill of a lifetime. And that's more of a summertime fishery, as is the snook fishing. But the tarpon, when these glass minnows show up, when these glass minnows show up, these, the tarpon are going to be here. And when they get here, boy, they get here in droves. Now, glass minnows. Well, the glass minnows are about this big. Also, when you're, I get asked every year about glass minnows, greenies, pilchards, mullet, any kind of, because we got all kinds of baits showing up. Sardines, everything coming down the beach. I put pictures of all of our local bait fish in there, so if you need to identify something, there's a couple pages in there that, that you can identify the bait fish so you know what it is that you're, you're putting on your hook. Now the glass minnows, you're going to know the glass minnows are here because when they come down the beach, it looks like a big oil spot. They're almost black. Down they come. They could be 20 yards. They could be 40 yards. They could be right at your feet. When you start seeing those glass minnows, that's when you're going to see a lot of tarpon. They are tearing them up. And after a lot of trial and error, and I, you know, I used to throw big spoons at them. You'd throw swim baits. You threw this. You threw that. A live croaker. You will get one on a live croaker too. And it, and I'm going to talk about them because they're two of my favorite fish here after this. But the live croaker got a picture in there of two ways to hook them one through the anal fin on the bottom and they have two uh, you know in their snout you can put it through there pitch out a live croaker but I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an inside track on something that in the last two years I've hooked more tarpon and my son and I have hooked more tarpon than in the nine years that I've been here and you're probably gonna think I'm crazy because when I show you the rig you're gonna say you expect me to believe that 
Well, the last time we had the, only when the glass minnows are here. The last day that we had the glass minnows last year, my son hooked six tarpon in an hour. The problem was they were too big. You know, I'm using a, a 6,000 battle, you know, on a, on a seven six rod that's medium heavy, and all these fish are over 100 pounds. So th th there, there's no chance. That's a knife at a gunfight. But a 50 pounder, I would have caught him. If you go on the beach early in the morning, or if you have a glass minnow net, and now it tells me we just got a bunch of glass minnow cast nets in. Obviously, it's a real small mesh. When I go on the beach early in the morning a lot, when these when these glass minnows are here in this, you know, it's more of an early summer than a late spring, but who knows? This year has been crazy anyway. When the sun starts to come up and you're walking down to pick your spot to fish on the beach, and you see little silver all over, those are all glass minnows, dead ones. They've either been chased up at dawn by who knows what, could be mackerel, could be jacks, who knows, it could be tarpon. Who knows what it is, but you pick them up and put them in a bucket. They don't have to be alive. They can be dead. <clears throat> or, like my grandson, sometimes the schools are so thick, when my grandson comes down, he takes a little bait net and he actually scoops them out of the water. Don't rely on that if you want to try to hook a few. Pick up the glass minnows. If you see them on the beach, you'll see the birds. You might have to scurry the, the seagulls and everybody away, but get as many as you can and put them in a small bucket or a pail or containers or something like that. Now I'm going to show you the rig. And we're not we're not bluegill fishing because that's what you think you're going to be doing. Now that's your standard red and white bobber, is it not? You're not fishing for largemouth bass in Okeechobee. You can use a float or a bobber you can use you know any type of float that that are sold anywhere uh, you can use a balloon a small balloon the same thing I just like this because it actually cast a little but you don't want a long leader because when I tell you where you're gonna cast this you don't want it sitting on the bottom you want it just like this that's 40 pound fluorocarbon that's a 3-0 or a 4-0 circle hook that's your main line going to your bobber you take as many of these baits that you can possibly, as many glass minnows as you can jam onto this hook, 10, 12, 13, you put them on that hook. Wherever the glass minnow school is, you can see them obviously, it's usually dead calm, it's clear, and you got, you can see because you'll see some jacks tearing through them, you'll see all kinds of bait, you'll see the tarpon rolling in them. What you want to do is pitch this out with 10 or 12 glass minnows on it on the outside edge, on the eastern edge of the glass minnow school. Once you do that, tarpon are lazy. Another great bait is the ladyfish heads fished on the bottom. Not much thought process there, it's sitting on the bottom. The nice thing about this, you might hook a big jack, but the tarpon love it. They it needs to be on the outs. Now, if there's 20 yards out, you'll be casting it 20, put it right on the edge, not in the middle of the glass minnow school. You want to be on the edge of the bait school, on the outside edge. Once that happens, hold on. You are not going to believe. My son, when we first started doing this, we, we kind of figured out how to do this. He didn't believe it. Well, like I said, the last day we were out, he hooked six. And it was just a matter of we ran out of glass minnows. You could have caught, you could have hooked another five or six of them. Glass minnows on a circle hook pitched on the outside edge, you will catch tarpon. I use the same method in New Jersey, the same fleece for a striped bass. Okay. Exactly the same thing. No, exactly. no. Yeah. Catch, catch stripers when nobody is catching anything. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. Same thing here. It's the same thing, same same thing, thing. Same thing. Same thing here. You know, don't overthink this. Don't think. Now. Your buddy, if he's never been fishing with you, he's going to see you put this rig on. He's going to say, what, what are you doing? I mean, what are you doing? When you hook about an 80-pound tarpon, you can say, this is what I'm doing. They will eat this, and believe me when I tell you, just make sure, depending on how deep the water is, you just want to be up off the bottom a little bit. And sometimes you'll see the tarpon actually 
they're so close, you'll see them actually go down and grab this, or sometimes they come out of nowhere. You'll see the glass middle school part. They don't want to chase the live ones. They got dead ones here. Much easier to catch. Make sure your drag's not too tight. Nothing. 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 You're just going to pitch that. The bobber, depending on what weight you use, will allow you. There's not much wind during that. You know, it's, it's usually pretty calm. Now, if it's blowing east like it is tonight, you probably don't have a chance. Yeah, yeah, you'll be fishing up in the dunes. But you go ahead and pitch this out. You will hook a tarpon. It works. Please trust me on this because for two years we've been doing it and we've hooked an awful lot of tarpon. Now, you want that 50-pounder if you want to take a picture. You don't want the 150-pounder because you, you need something, you know, knife to a gunfight with some of these. But that's, that's how you will hook some of these tarpon. The last couple fish I want to talk about, and then I'll, I'll get on, uh, get on to the next, are my favorites. They are the whiting and the croaker. Now, I sell a lot of pompano, but I keep a lot of pompano. For, you know, I'll keep them. My wife likes them. But if you put a pompano down next to a whiting fillet in front of me, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I'm not sure which way I'm going there. I, I'm probably going with the whiting. And I will tell you, they are starting to show. The whiting are, are here. The croaker are not. Usually the croaker are the last to come after the whiting. Water gets to be around 80, but we're getting close. Uh, Carl inside here does a lot of fishing at Normandy. He caught, he caught seven or eight croaker, I don't know, two weeks ago up at Normandy. So I, I'm sure they're starting to show. Now I'll give you a little tip on the croaker real quick so I don't forget and bypass it. The biggest croaker you will catch all year on the beach. Glass minnow schools again. This is, a, this is my croaker rig. I like the red floats. I like the little, that's a 3407 uh, Mustad hook, size four. A little piece of shrimp to start them off with a bloodworm fish bite. Once you get them going, you don't need the shrimp. Just put the bloodworm fish bite. Last year, I had a, I had quite a few whiting and croaker charters in June and July, and I, I got to the point where I had to cap the people at like 60 fish because I just didn't want to play anymore. So, but the glass minnows, the reason I'm saying this about the, the biggest croaker you were gonna catch all year are underneath the glass minnow schools. You take this rig and you pitch it into the center. It could be right there where the just-in-time thing. You could pitch it right there if that's where the glass minnow school is. Two at a time. And they are big croakers. You're, you know, they catch a lot of big croakers, guys, and boats. Sure, Keith does. Up here in the river, St. Lucie River, around the Roosevelt Bridge, you catch them, catch them all the time. We don't get those big ones for whatever reason out in the ocean. We, You know, I, my rule of thumb is kind of like the pompano. If it's 11 inches, I'll keep it. Anything smaller than that, unless you want to use it for bait. Anything smaller than that, uh, I kind of, I just release and let go. But that little pitch into a glass minnow school, you will not believe the size of the croakers. Now you got to remember, the, these croakers are eating fish that could be four or five inches long. You know, it's not that little piece of shrimp that you got there. But you will catch some huge croakers during the, I call it late spring, early summer, especially when the bait schools show up. But in the middle, right in the middle of the school, the glass minnows, when that sinker hits, they kind of move out. And as soon as that hits the bottom, when those croaker are there, you'll get the rod yanked out of your hands. It's, you don't even have to look for them. I, I had one fella, he's a mortgage broker from up here in Jensen Beach. He got so excited, he started chasing, we had one glass minnow school last year, he started chasing it up the beach. I got to be about a quarter of a mile up the beach. His name's Chris. I said, Chris, that's my limit, buddy. You want to go up there, I'll give you a bucket and you can bring all the fish back. I'm not chasing them a mile up the beach. But he was catching them on every cast. So, big croaker, but that's that's coming. I mean, that's coming. That, that That's definitely coming. Another thing about the whiting. I saw them Sunday. They were at my feet when I went to cast for the Pompano. Water was clean up north. I'm starting to see them in that first trough right on the edge. The biggest problem that people don't understand about whiting and croaker, it's a pitch, and I, I thank Henry for this, 
the, the owner of the uh, stuff duck. Of course, Freddie's running it now. But I remember Henry saying, and he must have said it a hundred times, it's a pitch, not a cast. When you start trying to cast to the Bahamas to catch Whiting and Croker, you're not going to catch any. They're going to be right at your feet. Now, the, the deal with the, with the Whiting and Croker, as far as eating, they're great. And here's the bite pattern on them, too. I don't use circle hooks. I use J-hooks for Whiting and Croker, especially when I take somebody fishing on the beach. I want you hooking the fish because this is what happens. When I've got when my oldest son is coming down, and I hope there's some Whiting and Croker. He's coming down this Saturday for a week. I will learn when they come down and they haven't done that kind of fishing in a year, I'll usually, I oh man, that first day I'll get 13, 14 fish before they get one. If you set up on that first tap, tap, and go to set the hook, empty hooks. Here, here's what they do, and you can, if you get a real clear day, you'll see them, and Whiting will do the same, Whiting and Croker bolt. They come up and they, they bite the bait, but they actually back off it a little bit. Now, you can get one of these big bull whiting that I'll talk about in a minute because we got two different species here now. Sometimes they'll just grab it, but if you're getting a tap and you're not catching anything, and you go, you don't, if you go to set the hook right away, you're not going to catch them. Here's what I tell everybody I take and when I, when I take somebody up to the beach. Leave it. I took, if actually, if, here's a, if you want to watch a video, Dar Sizzle, if you've anybody watches Dar Sizzle, I took her croaker and whiting fishing last year, her and Brian, and in the beginning, of course, you don't, you don't see it. You know, it takes them getting used to, but obviously she's a pretty darn good fisherman, but when, when you go to set that hook, you got to let them eat it. As soon as the tip of your pole, and it's not tap, tap, once the tip of the pole starts to go, they picked it up. That's when you set the hook. Now, if, if you've done it a lot, I mean, it, it took Darcy about one fish to figure that out, but for some reason, my kids, it'll take them all day. So, uh, don't set the hook right away. If you get suicidal ones, okay, you'll catch them. You will definitely catch them. But let them bite it, tap, tap, tip goes down, set the hook. And there are days when that first one being hooked, once you get him hooked, if you give him a little bit of slack, the second one's jumping right on, you'll catch him two at a time. Because when those schools come in, they come in. Now, I will say, the new, now here's the exact opposite of what I just told you about the Pompano. I'll give you a little local knowledge here. The beaches up to the north, the deeper beaches, not anywhere near as good as the beaches from the Jensen Circle south. Tiger Shores, the north end of Stewart Beach, phenomenal for whiting and croaker whether it's if you when you go there you're going to see a bunch of little hills i call them little troughs there's a bunch of them you might have four or five of them on these beaches down here well there's four or five opportunities for these fish to travel up and down and find food one thing about the whiting when the water gets clear and i watched them i was getting frustrated up at coconut when the whiting are right in front of you, and you'll see them, you will see them. When you start pitching the bait, when they're right in front of you, most of the time you'll scatter them. But you'll see four or five of them, and they're always, they usually travel with the current. So if you got a north current and it's going to the north, you see a bunch go by you, pitch that bait up about 10 yards, where they're going to swim up to it, you'll catch them. But if they you stay right here, you might catch a couple, but you're not going to catch them. They're not stupid either. I mean, usually you're throwing a shadow and they, they see what's going on. But the bigger whiting do that. We have two different types of whiting here. It used to be, you know, we have a southern, it's called a kingfish. Southern kingfish or a gulf kingfish. Those are the two types of whiting. Now, the, the gulf kingfish is the one that's prevalent, you know, the silver one that we, everybody knows about down here that was here forever. I mean, I didn't catch a lot of the other type for the longest time, but the last two years, more and more are showing up. The silver with the black spot is the most common. That's the one that we got here. The other type is gonna have some brown bands on it. They get big. I caught them at County Line there uh, last June. I mean, heck, we were getting them 16, 17 inches long, but that's, 
that's the other type. That's, you know, the, the Gulf is the silver one, the Southern is, is the brown one. You're gonna know it. Now, the other one, I will tell you, the ones with the brown stripes, they take some, you need to take care of them. The meat is not as firm as it is on the silver type. So they need to go into the ice right away to keep them because the last thing you want to do is mess up those uh, mess up those fillets. And when you fillet those fish, cut them behind the you know right by the gills. I I did a video on it last year. I got a lot of a lot of people took a look at it too. You cut them, make one cut, slide your knife right down the backbone, flip the fillet over. Do not cut it all the way off. You still want it attached to the skin. When you flip it over, you take your knife, one one pass, cut the belly bone out. When you're done, you've got a whiting or a croaker, either one. You've got them with two pieces of skin on them, no bones. And I I, I always leave one, one recipe in here, uh, at least one. I think you have one. That's for sliders. That is my favorite way of, of, of uh, eating those fish. And I will tell you, boy, I, you put a pompano. I'm, I'm probably going the other way with the with the with the whiting and the uh, and and the croakers. They can get at times. They can get if it's dead, dead, dead calm. They can get a little leader shy and bling shy also. But the, I'm going to tell you to do the same thing, and I've had to do it a few times. Take it off. Take the float off. Most of the times, especially with the croakers, the croakers don't, they must be, as far as an intelligence level to the whiting, they must be below them because they don't care much about, but the bigger whiting, especially those, we call them bull whiting, the big ones, they can get a little skittish. So what you want to do, you want, if you have to, if you can see them, see them, see them, and you pitch up and they're not eating, take something off. But these bloodworm fish bites, once you've caught a couple, I'll, I'll take a half a dozen, maybe a dozen shrimp, I'll take them with me. That will usually get them going. And there's sometimes when you see them, I might cut three or four shrimp and a couple peaches pieces and just pitch it out, almost like you're chumming. But once you get them going, and they get, because you'll see them, I mean, all of a sudden, these fish will converge in that first trough. Once you get them going, Boy, it's game on. And like I said, then you get to the point of how many do you want to fillet? Because uh, we, we're lucky that we have a we have a nice uh, uh, a nice fishery for that. But they are, without a doubt, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, I mentioned George Poveroma. If I call George Poveroma right now and I said, George, I just got a load of white, and he goes, I'll be there in the morning. I mean, it, it, they're 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 just that just that good eating. Um, Alec, have I gone over? Okay. So, yeah, I, like I said, when, once I get going with this stuff, I just keep going and going and going. Jack prevails. I tell you what, you're going to see some. You know, I always like to talk about jacks. I always say the same thing at every seminar, and people that come to my seminars, as far as I'm concerned, that should be the state fish. There is not a fish that fights harder than a jack prevail. I don't care if you catch a one pounder or you catch a 25 pounder. Those fish don't give up. I don't care what it is. In the springtime, especially when these bait schools are moving, boy, you get some beasts on these bait schools, 25, 30 pounds. I know, I know some of the folks have been catching some in the river already. So the, uh, but the nice thing about them is I don't care what you throw at them, they're probably gonna eat it. I mean, you wanna throw an artificial, you just make sure that you got, you got some line on there. Uh, so if you get that 25 pounder, you're not getting spooled and he's not, you know, he's not going from Fort Pierce to St. Lucie Inlet because you get some, you get some awful big jacks. And again, they, they have a tendency to, to eat everything, but they will, they will certainly, certainly pull and pull and pull. I'm going to mention the snook. We're starting to see, I mean, I guess they're starting to see some out by the inlet a little bit. Maybe they're starting to move. I obviously they're not. They're still catching some up in the a river. The river's slowing down. Yeah, so that so that's, are moving out and the are moving out of the river. There you go. So what, what they're gonna do, they're gonna be moving out. Now, during the best months, you know, 
the fishery shut down. But if you want to have some fun, you get some of these live croakers. I'll I tell you what, Snook Nook, as usual, is the only one. They're, they're front runners on everything. They have, a, they have an outlet, or they have a supplier now for live croakers, and I'm not sure there is a better bait than a live croaker for a snook. I, I just don't think there is. But you can actually sight fish for them as we get into the warmer months. You know, when they start that spawn around the inlets, and they start coming out to eat, you know, after that moon, and they're swimming up and down that trough, boy, that's why they're there. They're there to eat. Well, you can get the nice thing about hooking one on the beach, whether it's on a live croaker, tell you what, big shrimp. They'll eat a big shrimp. But if you got a live croaker, chances are that snook is going to eat it. Unlike in here, if you're fishing the causeway or you're fishing a dock or you're fishing a seawall, they got nowhere to go. It's sand. So you might have to put your track shoes on a little bit if you're using a, uh, you know, using a lighter rig here. And you might have to go down the beach and catch it and get it in. But boy, you will get some bites like you can't imagine. And a lot of it's going to be sight fishing because they'll come up in twos and threes. And you can see them. My wife used to uh, sit there and read a book and she'd yell up to me, here come two. Here come three. And here they come. I mean, you can see them when that water's gin clear and they're coming up that first drop. You got to remember, once they come outside, their favorite fish is a live croaker. I mean, they're they're all over the croaker, and you hear all the stories about they eat croakers because the croakers eat all their eggs, and you know, and they you know their spawning cycle is 18 hours when they start spawning, and eggs go out and come back in. But the croakers have a tendency to eat them, so they're eating the croakers. But once the snook come up on the beach, you can use a pin, you can use a small whiting. But if you can catch a few of the smaller croakers, boy, put them on and, and have some fun. And like I said, they're, they're, you know, especially the fish that are spawning, you know, in June and July is when we get into that, that time frame. Uh, get them off the hook. You can't keep them anyway, whether it's a slot or not. Take care of the fish. Get it back out. I mean, the snook fishery is uh, inside has been pretty darn good this year. There's been a lot of fish. Hold them. Hold them. That's right. That's right, Keith. Okay. Do not... You know, you see the people holding them like this. Support the in, the internal organs of that fish. So once you take them off, put it right back in the water. Just get it back in the water as quick as you can. It's a fishery. I mean, pompano is the number one sought after saltwater fish all winter. But if there's a fish that is in Florida, especially southeast, that more people fish for than any species on a 12-month basis, it's a snook. So, and we got, we got a pretty darn good fishery here. So uh, let's let's keep it like that. Beaches. Let me talk about a couple beaches. Uh, you've got a list of beaches here, and like I said, I made mention, and I'm like I said, I'm going to get hung out to dry here tomorrow. You need to fish north if you want if you want to get in on these pompano. Uh, go back to Middle Cove. I haven't fished there in two years. You know, I had, had not fished there in two years. There's some good areas. If you're going to fish Middle Cove, I will give you a hint also. It used to be everybody fished to the south. You walk down as far as a yellow house that's on the beach. That's pretty well filled in. Go the other way. Go north. I will give you a landmark since you're nice enough to have sat here and had to bear with me all night. There are some dead trees when you go to the north. From there, north. There's also some patchy rock out there, so you're probably not going to reach it, but it's a good habitat, especially for the pompano on uh, calm days. They have a tendency, they like to hide in that, but if you want to go north, go north at Middle Cove from those trees, and you can fish all the way up, all the way up. Moving up there, you know, you got, you know, past Middle Cove, then you got Frederick Douglass, the horse, uh, the horse beach. And by the way, if anybody that hasn't fished John Brooks here, this year, the horse beach has expanded because now you got horses coming up as far as John Brooks. Now, I will tell you, if you're pulling a cart and it's dark, horses are heavy. And what they're doing, they are making indentations in the sand that all of a sudden you're, you think you hit a pothole in New York City. You got no potholes like they got up there. So you need to be careful. So, But they are going up that way. But Frederick Douglass has been holding some fish. 
John Brooks has been holding some fish. They've been holding. John Brooks has been holding fish all. Uh, you know, it, it, that's a pretty good go-to spot. You got to remember those beaches are deeper. At Brooks, I think at uh, Frederick Douglass, I think those majority of rocks I believe are to the south. I don't fish there. I got a couple friends that fish there, and I think the rocks are to the south. If you go to the north, you're good. Brooks, it doesn't make any difference. Now the next beach, Blue Heron, past uh, the new the new pizza place. And by the way, if you haven't been to the pizza place, you need to go there. You, you need to go there. I mean, it's unbelievable. Pie hole's unbelievable. Um, Blue Heron, when you come around where Pie Hole Pizza is now, Blue Heron Boulevard is right there. Right before the condos. You make a right. You need to know you have to make a right because you cannot see the parking lot. You think it's part of the condos. A lot of sand fleas been up that way. Sand fleas this time of year, southeast wind, afternoon. A couple different reasons. They like that southeast wind for whatever reason or any, anything out of the east. But the afternoon, the people have stopped walking up and down the beach. Sand fleas, I mean, you're not going to get them at Stewart Beach on Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock. It's just not going to happen. They're, they're six feet under. But they, they do come up in the afternoon when the light starts to get a little lower. And there have been some, been some pretty good shots of sand fleas up there. But that, that Blue Heron Beach, that's where you park. I will tell you this about Blue Heron Beach, and I don't know how they did this. At 7 o'clock, there's a gate like we have on all the beaches. They lock it. I think the condos own the parking lot, but it's a public beach. Now, here's, here's where you roll the dice, because I've had a couple days up there where I got locked in. Hey, they will not come and tell you. I'm just telling you, at 7 o'clock, there's one or two security people up there that ride around that will lock the gate. There is a phone number to call. Now, the... The upside and downside to that is, if you get the right security person, you say, I'm locked in, you call them on your cell phone, they could be there in five minutes, or they could be there on the one day that I went there, and it was an hour and five minutes, you're locked in. But they locked the gate at seven o'clock, so remember that, it's a public beach, but the parking lot will get locked. Now, Blue Heron, I do not like to fish to the north for the simple fact, that's where all the condos are up that way. You know, a lot of those folks like to walk out of their con. I, I don't want to infringe on what they're doing. But I got a buddy that uh, has a boat that has run Fort Pierce Inlet all the way down to the power plant. And if you, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's, it's deep here, but it's shallow here. Blue Heron Beach makes no difference. I don't care where you fish, it's deep. You've got a real deep trough, 40 yards, 50 yards you're going to catch pompano, especially on high tide. There, I've, a lot of times, I'll fish two rods short this time of year because there's that many pompano that run up and down that Blue Heron Beach. Going further up, then you got coconut. You make it right on a coconut. You can park there. That's a little limited. It's not a big area. But a couple beaches that a lot of folks don't fish are Corpus and Surfside as you get up into, into uh, Fort Pierce. Very, very deep beaches. If you can only fish, if you're going to target pompano this time of year, and you can only fish in the afternoon. As it turns out, you got the tie chart from the snookling. You say, look at this, we got dead low at four o'clock. Don't worry about it. You go north of the power plant, you can fish dead low water. Don't worry about it. There's plenty of water, you will catch fish. But remember what I said, sun's coming down now. Hopefully these black tips have started to move start to get out of here but the uh, but those afternoon bites high tide in the afternoon between three o'clock and five o'clock get the rods get up to the beach get in on the end of this fishing and hopefully like we've said all along that we're keeping our fingers crossed it's going to be a late season and there could be some darn good pompano fishing coming up here in the next in the next three to four weeks I mean there's we would normally catch them up Usually by about more Memorial Day, you're catching a lot of small ones again like you do in the beginning, but there's still a lot of fish south. So uh, if you still want to catch them popping up, don't think you can. Yes? Well, that's the parking lot, but if once, you know that turnaround, that's, once you go down, you'll see the gate. You know, it's at the end of the... 
they got those dumpsters there on the right. Oh, there's a gate there. Believe me, there's a gate there, and uh, and and they will lock in. Now you're, you're not going to be stuck there, but it, it can be an inconvenience to you. You know what I mean? If I'm ca I've had a situation where I'm catching fish and I knew I was going to get locked in, and I I really didn't care. I knew I was going to get home at some time, but I you know I'd like to get home by midnight. Huh? Seven o'clock. And there's one security officer, I will tell you, it's not 701, it's 7 o'clock. Right. 